Bulletproof Radio, a state of high performance. You're listening to Bulletproof Radio with Dave Asprey. Today's cool fact of the day is that most people don't know how a grenade works, and Hollywood doesn't really help. The pin on a grenade prevents the lever or spoon from flipping off, which arms the fuse on the grenade. The standard grenade, the M67, can usually go about 30 or 35 meters, or just call it yards, because after all it's government, and at least that's by a man. The fuse delays detonation for about four to five seconds after the spoon is released, which gives the grenade time to travel that far. And so it, it's a lot less dramatic than they make it in Hollywood. And you might ask, why the heck is Dave talking about grenades today? Well, it's because the Bulletproof Conference in September is going to totally blow up. And I'm a huge fan of really, really bad puns, and that was one for sure. You can actually thank my buddy Brock here who helped me come up with that, or I should say maybe forced me to come up with it. Before we get going on today's episode, there's something else way more interesting than grenades, although actually blowing stuff up is kind of fun. I am so pleased to announce two new roasts of Bulletproof processed coffee beans. These are mold-free, independently lab-tested coffees, and they're made at our Bulletproof plantations. We just changed how we roast them. The first new roast is called The Mentalist. It's available in whole bean and ground. It's a medium to dark roast, kind of right in the middle there. It's got dark cocoa and vanilla aromatics that open up to a rich, full-bodied coffee with some cherry sweetness and notes of almond and caramel in there as well. It's profoundly good. I've been putting it in my espresso machine, and man, it's crazy. You take it, and it's engineered to taste amazing with butter and brain octane oil. A lot of coffee tastes bitter and weird when you put butter in it, not this stuff because, well, we built it that way. The next one is for you if you really like your dark flavored, dark roast coffee. It's called French Kick. It's a dark roast, but it's not charcoal. It's smooth and sweet, it's pleasantly, almost a little bit smoky, and it's got baking chocolate notes, but it finishes really clean and has a medium body. This is one of the few dark roast coffees I like. I am not a fan of those burned things that you might find at the corner coffee shop. This isn't one of those, but we pushed it as close to dark as we could get and still maintain that flavor for you. You will be amazed at how you feel when you have this coffee, just like you are with our existing coffee. And now you've got a whole palette of coffees you can play with, depending on if you like espresso, French press, immersion, or just drip brewing. However you like your coffee, you can do it, and you're gonna just be amazed at the flavors. I'm excited to share these with you. Today's podcast is a special edition of Bulletproof Radio, and it was recorded at the Bulletproof Conference last year, and it's with Eli Block from One Taste. One Taste is a group of people looking at the effects of orgasm on human consciousness and human performance. In case you're wondering, the the content here is, shall we say, uh, anticlimactic, in that (laughs) it's not inappropriate. Uh, in any way, shape, or form. Uh, We're talking about science and we're talking about emotions, but we're not talking about uh, getting down, if you know what I'm saying. And to encourage you to check this out, head on over to the video page, and I'll give you the URL in a second, and at the end of the video, there's a substantial special discount on the Bulletproof Conference. So if you're thinking about attending the Bulletproof Conference, you wanna see what it's like, this is a good video for you to see, and if you watch it and learn and hear the same things you're gonna hear if you're just listening to the iTunes version, uh, we'll give you a, a pretty substantial discount there. So head on over to bulletproofexec.com slash orgasm video. Yes, bulletproofexec.com slash orgasm video. Hi, Bulletproof audience. This is Eli Block from One Taste, www.onetaste.us. Um, I have some follow-up questions from the podcast I did with Dave the other day that I'd love to answer. So here we go. Number one, Callie Love on Twitter wants to know, you mentioned it briefly in your talk with Dave, but I wonder what your in-depth thought of the new female Viagra or Flib and Sarin and how it will affect women's sexual experiences and for that matter, their orgasms. Well, Callie Love, that is a great question. I spoke to orgasmic medicine specialist Teresa Diaz, MD, about her take on the new female Viagra, and here's what she had to say. She said that it must be taken for more than a month and continuously. Its its effectiveness rate is between eight and 13%, which is actually quite low. 
The improvement in pleasurable sex was from an average of 2.8 events per month to 4.5 events per month. And there are side effects such as fainting, dizziness, and low, low blood pressure, many of which were found to be exacerbated by alcohol and hormonal contraception, so forget your birth control, not yet on the market, and it's only prescribable by a doctor who's taken a certification class. So on the one hand, it sounds like a really good idea that for some people who want to pop a pill, this could actually lead to some more enjoyment. Now, there's a whole barrel of monkeys involved in actually getting one of these pills and seeing eventually down the line after taking it for a month and possibly fainting and all of those things if it's actually going to work for you. My perspective is, why don't you try something which actually gets you closer to your partner, which builds both of your intimacy and connection and is a natural alternative to a pharmaceutical hack which is actually relatively unproven at this point? Thanks for your question. Number two. Sojin from the forum writes, Taoism lays its spiritual belief on a mysterious force or qi that is supposed to inhibit matter in any form, living or non-living. According to the Taoists, qi or semen was responsible for sound body and mind. Practitioners of this conviction avoid ejaculating too much of their semen during sex. Well, Sojin, to us, orgasm is also qi, not just uh, what a man would ejaculate. And there's actually a few different questions rolled into this one, which I'll address. One of them is that um, I think too much, I think your question was uh, avoid ejaculating too much. I agree with you. I think too much is definitely something which each person has to assess for themselves. And I love Dave's take on this. I love the experiment that he did around ejaculation. I think that is brilliant. And I learned something myself from, from that experiment. What I will say, I got two other things for you. One is that... Um, I have heard the viewpoint that you should basically save all of your semen and save it 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 and, save it and potentially die with all of it. And it makes me think of this guy that I knew when I was a little kid. And he was rich. This guy had so much money, he didn't know what to do with it. And he wouldn't spend any on himself. He had um, these kind of like ratty old jeans and like beat up pair of tennis shoes and like kind of like the same outfit every day and like drove an old beat up car and lived in a crappy house and his whole life was just devoted to the acquisition of wealth. And he never really got to enjoy any of it. And so my take on Climax is, um, I think it's actually there to be enjoyed. I think there's something really awesome about enjoying all of the riches that you build up. That's the first thing. Um, the second thing is, I'll give you my own personal viewpoint, I'm married. And I think that, um, well, I'm the kind of guy who honestly has a hard time going out of control. And one of the things that I find women find really frustrating in sex, you know, you know, in my experience, my wife included, is when I'm in too much control. I think, I think the whole point of connection is take us out of control. And so um, if we're concentrated on controlling this experience and controlling this experience and controlling this experience and making sure this thing was going to happen, whoops, we climax every now and then. Um, that's not very much fun to someone who's actually interested in taking you out of control. And if you've ever noticed, um, women have a really fine knack for doing that. So that's my, that's my, view, my viewpoint. You read into that however you want to. Okay. Uh, okay. OG man has a great question from online. He asks, can psychedelics help a person's oming practice? What about sex and pot? Well, OG man, here's what I think. Oming is actually a consciousness practice. It's a meditative practice where you're doing your best to be as present as possible without adding anything extra. So um, to that point, ohm is a nothing extra practice. So we don't play music during ohm. Um, we don't add like a really intense spiritual overlay to the practice so that you have to learn some other like God and goddess forms thing just to have a connected experience with your partner. Um, we don't ohm in exotic locations attempting to affect our experience. We do everything we can to control the conditions that the practice takes place because here's what we've found. Changing the conditions outside of yourself doesn't really help you get free. There's no freedom in hoping that that person or that person does something different so that you can have a more peaceful, more amazing life. Change actually happens from within. 
And so that's why we don't augment our own practice with drugs or, um, again, like music or any of the other things like candles or any of the things that we would do to try to um, create conditions that would give us a more intense or more uh, meaningful or more psychedelic experience. Om is a practice of you learning to use your attention and grow your consciousness to experience more and more and more of your partner. Because I would hate to have it be that you've got an own practice dependent, that your awareness in this world is dependent on your psychedelics, right? You, you get in a, the next great uh, fight with your partner and you both have to do acid in order to actually get to the important part of the argument where you guys kiss and make up. Come on, does anybody really want that? So oming is a practice where you can actually go into these expanded states and go into these intense experiences and actually um, use the same muscles in the rest of your life, whether it be in your sex life or in your business life or anywhere else you can use it. So we say um, always do 15 minutes, always do it the exact same way so that you're not changing the conditions to get more freedom. Trish, Trish from California writes, do sex toys benefit or deter from an oming practice? That's a great question, Trish. And I think that um, I talk about this a little bit in the Bulletproof podcast with Dave. But the thing about vibrators is that they, um, they vibrate. They, <laughs> you've got a, a set of very in, uh, delicate nerve endings on the clitoris. Between eight and 80,000 nerve endings on the clitoris depend on, depending on who you talk to in the medical profession, they'll say between eight and 80,000, okay? And these, um, these uh, at, the, at the surface of the skin, um, they get uh, very tendril-like and very, very fine. And so what ends up happening with vibrator use is that you have to get bigger and bigger ones. I remember I had a girlfriend once who showed me the evolution of her vibrators. It was like, oh, I started with like the cute little rabbit one. And then, you know, going faster and harder with that, she lost some sensitivity. So she had to get the other one, like the slightly bigger, like, you know, 100 more horsepower version, right? And then after that, had to get the, 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 um, the Mitsubishi you know, like plugs into the wall, you know? And the thing about, about using vibrators is that you've got to go harder and you've got to go faster for the most part. You've got to increase pressure and in order to get the same results that you were once getting. Um, because what you're doing is you're, you're going into those nerves as opposed to drawing the nerves out to full extension and increasing your sensitivity, okay? That's the benefit of actually um, having a practice which increases your sensitivity, and so a lot of women don't realize why they feel like they don't have the orgasm that they want, they don't have the power in their sex that they want. Um, in a lot of cases of using vibrators, it's because over time, they've actually deadened their response trying to get more and more out of it. And so, um, you know, for that reason, OM tends to be a rehabilitative process for a woman's nerve endings and for her sensitivity in her genitals. Thomas from Facebook writes, you discuss oming as helping people with intimacy, not desire. But couldn't sexual desire be considered intimate if shared between two people? The short answer is yes. And I'm sorry that didn't come across all the way in the video and the podcast, but um, I think what I was probably getting at, and this maybe answers your question, is that um, sexual activity, desire, all of it, it can either be connected or disconnected. I think all of us have an experience of um, having someone approach us with a desire that doesn't really feel connected. And maybe we've had sex or a makeout or something which hasn't really felt that connected to us. And so OM helps people connect. It's really that simple. And so that connection um, can be in the sexual realm, of course. It can be in the desire realm, of course. Um, I put all those things in intimacy. I put all those things in the same box. And so um, does OM help with connection and having the connected versions of all of those things? Absolutely. Are there artificial versions of all of those things? Absolutely. And that's what I was talking about with Dave on the podcast when I mentioned, um, you know, uh, there's so many alternatives to having an actual live human being, um, like vibrators, like porn, which we can consume and consume and consume and never actually fill us up or ever, uh, never actually satiate our appetites. And so it's beginning to shift from a disconnected modality of all of those things, everything under that category, to a more connected reality. Um, first, bringing an actual human being into the picture, and second, learning how to actually connect, learning how the physics of connection actually work between people. J Dog on Facebook writes, 
You and Dave talk about oming when single. And Dave even said, sex starts when two people are in the room. But what if you don't want a partner? How can you use oming to get closer to yourself by choice? Well, j Dog, here's the rub about oming. Ohm is a partnered practice because you cannot take yourself out of control. You cannot take yourself anywhere new that you have not been before. You can't tickle yourself. You can't spontaneously high five yourself. There's all of these things that connection as a biological imperative is going to demand that you do or else we would all just stay at home isolated watching reruns of, you know, whatever your favorite TV show is, Scrubs, right? And so OM is a practice which gives you a biological imperative to connect and grows you as a human being in the process. Thanks for your questions and thanks for having me. If you're interested in knowing more about orgasm, orgasmic meditation, or myself, you can find us online at www.onetaste.us. Uh, my Twitter handle is at Eli Can Play. That's C-A-N-P-L-A-Y, at Eli Can Play. I'm also on Facebook, and you can find me at EliBlock.com. Please welcome to the stage, Mr. Dave Asprey. I've been tracking my sleep for a long time, including uh, actually a little bit more than 900 nights of, of sleep data. That's just using an iPhone app. I used to use the, the Zio and uh, a few other things. I had a Bedit sensor, which I really liked until it quit working because they changed their software back end. Uh, and I guess you have to have the Bluetooth version, but I had the professional version. Um, so I, I wish I still had a working Bedit. But all that time, I also use my iPhone because it's the simplest monitor. And I would encourage all of you when you're looking at tracking data, the easier it is, or even if it's completely invisible to gather data, then you've got something really interesting. But if you have to apply a lot of effort to get your data, you probably are going to quit doing it because applying effort requires willpower. And honestly, you could use willpower to track something or to like change something big. Use the willpower for the big stuff. And don't waste it on tracking data unless it's in the service of something you're specifically hacking that's going to be big. I'm going to share with you some things that happen at Bulletproof Labs, the location up on Vancouver Island where I do all sorts of crazy stuff, and address some of your top questions so we get some answers for you guys. What happens when you take GABA? If you look at this slide, 0% is, uh, well, 0%. It means nothing happened. And if the bar is green, it means there was a slight improvement. And if the bar is red, it means you didn't get a slight improvement. Every night when I go to bed, I pull out my phone, which has a Zentech screen protector on it, which means I'm not killing my melatonin for four hours. And it's also dimmed all the way, so I don't mind doing this. And the app that I'm running actually has a black background because it's well designed. <laughs> and I've filled out, oh, about 30 or so variables that I track. And if I did it that day, I tick a box. And that way, over time, I can get a picture that says, all right, did I do this? Did it make a difference? I take a little bit of GABA before I go to sleep most nights. In fact, probably enough nights that I've lost the signal from it because I take it most nights. I don't track, did I take 500 milligrams or 2.5 grams? There are studies of growth hormone that say you should take 2.5 grams of GABA. But if you take too much GABA, it makes you pant. So maybe you don't want to take too much GABA. Some amount of GABA might be helpful. GABA is an amino acid that enhances calmness. It's also a neurotransmitter. It's uh, an inhibitory or calming neurotransmitter. What I found was that I don't get that big of a difference in my sleep quality. It could be in the data or it could, could be not much else, but I do feel like it's worth taking some GABA because there's lots of science around that. Now GABA Wave, which we just had to stop manufacturing, <laughs> was noticeably more effective and I'm sorry about that, not my decision, um, but when you can't get the good stuff, you don't, you don't make it anymore. With GABA Wave, I am working, though, on a replacement that I can get on a regular basis that I think is going to have a very similar effect. We'll tell you after I'm done testing it. And it's interesting, though, that the difference between adding a phenol ring to something makes a noticeable change in sleep quality, but it's still just a little bit of a change. That said, when you're dealing with looking at data that you're tracking, the quality of the data is kind of important as well, and the metric for sleep quality includes length of sleep. So does this data say that I just slept more or that I slept better? And the problem with every sleep tracking system out there is that it includes length of time as a substantial variable. 
which maybe it shouldn't unless you get to pick the amount of time. Because if six hours is your target goal and you slept six hours and you got a lot of really good quality sleep in there, that's different than if your goal is eight hours and you got a lot of low quality sleep in there. And this idea of sleep quality versus sleep quantity is not well represented yet in our sleep tracking software. But in the meantime, this is a combination of number of times you've been in a cycle as well as length. So maybe I sleep a little bit more on GABA wave. If I do hyperbaric oxygen, ooh, that's getting to be a substantial difference. So on the days when I do hyperbaric, I sleep better. That's kind of cool. It helps to have hyperbaric in Bulletproof Labs <laughs> versus having to go out somewhere and give it a shot. But if you go out somewhere and, say, do email or watch Netflix for an hour inside a hyperbaric chamber and it wasn't too expensive, you'd probably do it sometimes, especially after a long flight, and if it made you sleep better. And uh, what about doing that thing I've been recommending ever since I started writing Bulletproof, which would be heart rate variability training? Right? If, you, if I do heart rate variability training, there's a substantial improvement in my sleep quality. And I can do that in one of two ways. I can do it with a sensor, or I could close my eyes and do it without the sensor, and I have about the same effect. But in this case, I track it on the days when I actually do heart rate variability, which, by the way, isn't every day, because honestly, my sympathetic nervous system is generally in reasonable shape. What about when I stick a laser on my head? You guys don't do that? There are medical lasers that increase mitochondrial function, cause you to grow new mitochondria, increase nitric oxide, increase blood flow in the brain. They can have a pretty profound effect, actually, but not, it turns out, on sleep very much. I usually do my laser inside hyperbaric oxygen, because what the heck, you got more oxygen, might as well use it. Do carbs at night really make a difference? For some people, they really do, but not that much for me. It also depends on the type of carbs. Hmm. It turns out that orgasms do not improve sleep quality even if they knock you out, at least for guys. <laughs> no, I'm not talking about frequency. That was a talk I gave at Quantified Self in 2012, I think. Pulsed electromagnetic frequency devices. I have a, a variety of them that I use. And when I use one of those, it does improve sleep quality. It's kind of interesting, right? This is almost three years worth of testing this stuff on whatever I felt like doing that day. If I try resistant starch, it works better than, say, just random carbs at night. However, I don't really fi find that it makes that big of a difference. I don't use re resistant starch right now. I think there's been a, a really big, really big uh, kind of war online about resistant starch. You know, it's, it's the, the coming of the Lord. Well. There's probably some usefulness for certain kinds of structured starch, but it's just generally saying more resistant starch is better. I'm going to eat a bag of green banana flour uh, because then I'll have more gut bacteria. I think you might be missing a few things in, in that overall equation. However, having the right kinds of stuff growing in your gut at even the right times, there's a good benefit for that. So intelligent use of prebiotics is a good idea, but there was a, a change in sleep when I did some resistant starch at night. I only did that for about three or four months because, uh, well, it just wasn't worth the trouble, and I didn't see any other of the amazing benefit changes that you're supposed to see from it. Far infrared sauna. The nights I do that, it improves sleep quality. Hmm. Sex and orgasm. Why would those be different? Because you can have sex without having an orgasm, but it turns out that if I... Looks like, looks like it's almost exactly the same here. So... I was sort of thinking that when I looked at the data before that uh, orgasm made me sleep a little bit less better than just plain sex, but it turns out that's not exactly the case. They look almost identical. I'd have to look at the percentage difference for you guys to tell you if there is one. But I'm pretty intrigued at the idea that if you have lots and lots of orgasms as a man, it, it definitely lowers your energy. But what it does to your sleep, I'm not quite sure. I can tell you when it does happen, it doesn't seem to help. What about just having a stressful day? I'm like, all right, well, did I feel like it was a stressful day? Actually, it seems like you sleep better to recover from stress. Isn't that a good thing? It could also be that you sleep worse. It's a question of how good you are at managing the stress. So acknowledging there was stress and recovering from it is a skill versus I was stressed, therefore I didn't sleep. How many people here have our time getting to sleep on a stressful day? Only four of you? I'm just kidding. So it's roughly, it looks like maybe a third to a half. And that's not uncommon. A lot of times it's that racing mind. Breathing exercises can make a huge difference. Heart rate variability techniques can make a big difference. 
I have not had a night where I've had thoughts keep me asleep in at least seven or eight years. It, it doesn't happen anymore. It used to happen all the time. You just can't get to sleep. But when you train your brain, and when you basically go in and repattern the parts of the brain that are seeing something out there as an existential threat that's actually not a threat, uh, when you get that done, uh, you really can go to sleep when you need to go to sleep. And then you have this effect, a stressful day, better sleep. Theanine is a calming amino acid found in green tea. It's great for relaxation and just a moderate improvement in sleep. It's possible because I take theanine in the morning and at night, particularly because theanine raises alpha in the brain. So uh, it's a very common supplement out there. And because it raises alpha waves by up to 20%, depending on dose and depending on your brain, I think it's generally a good idea to have it. So it could be just because I take it almost all the time that it, it goes down into average. But if I suppose I should quit taking it for a couple months and get the data, but I kind of like the way I feel on it, so I'm not going to do that. I am lazy. Remember when I say don't drink coffee after 2? Wait, doesn't it say coffee after 4? Okay, sometimes I have coffee at 2.30 if I'm re recording an extra episode of Bulletproof Radio. And I pay the price, just like I said I would. Right? So, really, I had coffee right before this. Which, oh, crap. I did it again. <laughs> and what about cryotherapy? When I, instead of spending an hour in cold the way Wim would, I, I violate the laws of nature and get way colder than Mother Nature. Let me do it for three minutes because I'm lazy. Just kidding. I, th I think Wim's uh, idea of being in cold ocean water is a good one, too. Uh, and they activate different uh, cold receptors as well. But uh, cryotherapy does improve sleep quality. And I, whenever I'm home, I do cryotherapy at least once a day and sometimes twice a day, unless I run out of liquid nitrogen, which is a problem that we all face. <laughs> I also have a custom-made uh, software that allows me to put my brain into a, a delta state using sounds. And this shows that it decreases sleep quality, but what actually happens is I only run that on nights when I'm really not going to get enough sleep. So I'm forcing myself to go more into a delta state rather than into a REM state. So I believe what's going on here is when I use that stuff that does make me feel more refreshed when I wake, I'm probably doing it on nights when I only got three or four hours of sleep. If I drink coffee at all during the day, which is most days, there's a very tiny improvement in sleep, but it's probably not statistically significant. So does coffee make you not sleep at night? Not for me, but for you, it's entirely possible if you have a problem metabolizing caffeine, it does, in which case there's something called decaf. But for the most part, a cup of coffee in the morning, or maybe one in the morning, one at lunch, which is the most I ever really have, you are not gonna have a hard time with sleep. Doing it after two, not so good. At least these numbers are pretty useful. Um, electrical stimulation. I sleep not as well when I do electrical stimulation, um, but it is an incredible burden the way I do it. Like I, <laughs> I, I really work myself out beyond what I could probably do without electrical stimulation. So that could be an exhaustion effect. Flotation tank, which is a really interesting technology. Float tanks allow you to turn off a lot of stuff in the environment around you. And I'll have to show you what mine looks like in a little bit. But the flotation tank also allows you to reset your amygdala, these very core, like, fight or flight fear parts of the brain. So if I lay there for an hour in a magnesium solution, I'm getting magnesium, which imp improves sleep quality through my skin, and I'm also getting this deep calming of the brain, which has a small effect on improving sleep quality. And taking 5-HTP, small improvement in sleep quality, which is a, a common sleep thing. Now, hypoxia, intermittent hypoxia. Like if you were to breathe really heavy to get way too much oxygen into the body, to get um, hyperoxic, and then say hold your breath and do push-ups until you had none left and you dumped all the oxygen out of your body. Well, I, don't, I didn't do it that way. I actually used an oxygen scrubber that I was breathing through to, to achieve hypoxia. But on the days I did that, I did sleep better, uh, which is probably because I was recovering more aggressively. If you eat a late dinner, this for me, it doesn't make a big difference. And I notice that there's lots of myths about, oh, if you eat at night, you'll get fat or it'll ruin your sleep. Well, it's true. If you have a lot of protein, especially the protein that raises your insulin levels at night, it can change the level of a substance in the brain called orexin, which is stimulating, and you don't sleep as well. Guess what drug affects orexin levels? 
modafinil, one of my favorites. So eating a steak at night, turns out there's a reason I recommend collagen if you're going to have protein before bed, because it's not one of those proteins like a whey protein, which I also make, but I'm like, do that one in the morning, just do it once a day, do it in the afternoon, but not right before bed. I don't think whey is great for most people. There are a few people who benefit from whey, but uh, I recommend taking them separately. Cerebral electrical stimulation, the Russian sleep machine, designed to give you more sleep and less time. <laughs> Wait, less time. That damn data comes up again. So when am I going to be running my Russian sleep machine with running electrical current between my ears? I'm going to be doing it on the nights when I'm only getting three hours of sleep, so the data is not going to be good here. I can tell you flat out, if you want to sleep almost nothing and wake up feeling human, um, the reason the Russians invented the cerebral electrical stimulation was this really cool thought. It, it's, it's Russian engineering at its finest. By the way, Russian engineers kick ass. But what they thought was, it's expensive to send astronauts to space. So let's make them not sleep, and we can send one third less. Like, it's brilliant. So they applied, instead of all these dollars, to buying rocket propellant and building bigger rocket ships, they applied it to research on sleep. <laughs> and they made a little device that runs a current across your brain and lets you feel refreshed after less sleep. Is it as good as a full night's sleep? Probably not. If you're on a spaceship, is your circadian rhythm kind of jacked anyway? I would think so, but I've never really tried living on a spaceship, so I wouldn't know for sure. What if you have, like, carbs really late at night, just like the midnight snack? Well, it turns out slight decrease in sleep quality, but it's not the end of the world. And what if you refrigerate your mattress? Okay, just run some ice water through your mattress. You guys don't do this? Uh, so I had a device that did that. Unfortunately, it kept leaking water on the floor, <laughs> which was a problem, given that whole mold thing. Uh, so I decided that I was going to stop that, but I really liked having a cold mattress when I had it. Um, plus, it kept beeping and waking me up, which I didn't like. So uh, other than that, a chilled mattress is really cool. It's just hard to pull off in real life. And um, why do I have theta on here two times? Interesting. Oh, yeah, delta, thank you, delta and theta. So delta is uh, uh, the very, very deep, almost dreamless sleep where you're getting growth hormone release, and theta is the dreaming state. So if you wanted to increase dreaming, you could do this. I typically don't do this very often. I used to do it quite a bit. I've tried commercial theta software. I've written my own tones. And uh, this shows a slight decrease in sleep quality, and I don't exactly know why. Um, but I would imagine it's probably because instead of doing the cycles that my brain would have done, that I'm telling it more dreams, more dreams, more dreams, so it's not going through the alpha cycles. But it's interesting that you can manipulate this at all. What's the effect of travel on sleep? Because I use my, my monitor when I travel all the time, and I, I tick that box that says traveling. Well, traveling screws up your sleep. You'd expect it to, right? Time zones, airplanes, hotels horrible lighting in hotel rooms, like you can't close the windows all the way, you have to tape over them with aluminum foil and then the staff gets all mad at you. This happens to you guys, right? Okay. I don't really bring foil, but I will offer an amazing travel tip. Okay, you look in the closet and they have those hangers with little clippies to hold your pants. Do you really need clippies to hold your pants? Probably not, but those clippies will hold the curtains together really, really well. That's what I use them for. On the days when I do the Bulletproof Vibe, which increases lymphatic circulation, I do sleep better. And my theory for the reason behind this, that is entirely not borne out by a study, is that one of the functions of sleep is to, look, uh, is to, to pump out toxic proteins that build up in the brain. So you have your glymphatic system that pumps cerebral spinal fluid into the brain, washes it, and then pumps it back out again. Well, if you've already done some oxygenation and you've done some lymphatic drainage, I think that your detoxing systems that work at night probably have an easier time of it, so you may get better quality sleep. It could also be a neurological effect. I don't really know, but I do like how I feel. I've done the Bulletproof Vibe today. When I was uh, doing one of the interviews that wasn't on video um, just a little while ago, I stood on the Bulletproof Vibe. The reporter thought I was weird. <laughs> and... Let's see, does a workout make you sleep better? In my case, marginally better, just because you want to recover better from a workout. So that was 900 days of sleep data and what I learned straight from the horse's mouth. How can you apply that? Actually, the things that were bigger on there, maybe you can try those things ahead. But the more interesting thing is, how much time did it take me to get this data? Here's what I do. 
you got to set your alarm at night to know what time you're going to wake up the next day unless you're one of those amazing people who like, doesn't have kids and doesn't have to get them to school at a certain time uh, or doesn't have a job where you have to get there on time. Uh, so assuming you set an alarm. By the way, how many of you wake up without an alarm every morning? Holy crap, you guys are weird. Just kidding. Is that roughly 20 25%? So um, the, rest, uh, the rest of you who set alarms, uh, or at least the rest of you may have backup alarms, what I do is I fire up the alarm app. I use Sleep Cycle. It's uh, some free or $2, some vanishingly inexpensive app. And I just go in and I say, here's all the things I'm interested in, the things I think might matter, or things I just want a record of, you know, did I do that? And I just check, 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 check. It literally takes me 10 seconds. And then I pick what time I want to wake up. My alarm also, I give it a 20-minute window. Say if I want to wake up at 7 a.m., it'll wake me up between 6.40 and 7 a.m. when I'm already at the top of a sleep cycle, which means I've never been jolted awake unless it's by, like, a child screaming and running at me or something then that will violate the alarm. But the, the really cool thing there is that I'm getting a better alarm than it would have had from any other kind of alarm system. And I got all this data, and it took me almost no time more than just setting the alarm in order to have almost three years of sleep data that's there. And it's not just sleep data, it's behavior data. Like, okay, do I really care how many times I orgasm in the last three years? Well, if I'm ever in a debate with Lana about that subject, I, I, okay. I don't know what value that data is, to be honest. But it's one of those things where it was almost free to get it. That data is maybe useful, maybe interesting. I would encourage you, though, in your self-tracking, do not over-obsess on data that you're not going to use for anything. And for me, I just want to know what makes me sleep better. And this has been kind of enlightening to go to the things you think would help. If you read Resistance Arch, it's supposed to be the coming of Jesus, basically. Um, at least it wasn't for my sleep. It was like you know a rounding error, just about. So let's switch gears. Let's talk about what's actually in Bulletproof Labs. And I'm working to make these technologies not like look at what weird people do, but more like why are these not in high school gyms? Why are these not widely accessible? Because these are ways that everyone can get more, more out of the amount of time and the amount of effort they put into what they do. So here's one of the things you'd see there. You'd see cryotherapy. Um, that would be me um, at 256 degrees below zero. I beat uh, Dr. Lana by three degrees, and I look more happy than she does. It's pretty clear. <laughs> This seems, if, okay, how many of you have tried liquid nitrogen-based cryo? Only maybe 10% of you. Here's the deal. Cold showers, good. Sitting in an ice bath will get your peripheral, your skin receptors, and your, your core cold receptors. And that is uncomfortable. This only gets the peripheral cold receptors. It's kind of like you're in a, a sweaty, like a hot place, and you walk outside and there's a blizzard and you're wearing shorts. But you only walk into your car that's already warmed up. You're like, no big deal. You just walk through cold air. How can you do that? Because if a swimming pool was that cold, you'd be frozen solid. It's because air isn't a good conductor. So what you're doing is you're telling about the, the outer few centimeters or few millimeters of your skin, oh my God, it's an ice age, you're gonna die. But the rest of your body, you're like, ha ha. <laughs> so that part of your nervous system is like, okay, get ready. Activate brown fat, grow more brown fat, burn white fat, burn hundreds more calories, turn off inflammation, sleep better, heal faster. All of those things happen, and we're talking up to three minutes of time, plus another maybe one minute to take your clothes off except your underwear. And if you have lots of piercings, you have to take those out too. Because if there's any metal on your body below your neck, the metal will absorb cold much more quickly than your skin, and then the metal will become so cold that it'll actually brand you. So that's a bit of a problem. So you basically go in there wearing underwear, socks, and gloves, and you kind of just chill, <laughs> and then you're done. In terms of benefit per minute spent, it is such an amazing technology. I've never found anything else like it, just for, for changing your inflammation levels and for just burning fat. It, it's pretty interesting. And the other thing that this kind of cold does is it triggers collagen synthesis. So if you're eating collagen, say upgraded collagen in your coffee, and you're telling your skin, make new collagen really quickly, you can see some pretty fast changes in it, which is a, a remarkable thing. So I'm, I'm very fortunate to have one of these at Bulletproof Labs. It's part of the research that I do. And I, as you guys know, I work to make all of the unusual technologies 
that I'm working on much, much more accessible. So on one of the days here, we had cryo available. I couldn't get the trailer that did it for all the days. But my goal is to get everyone here to give it a try. Maybe next year we can do that. And to make this something where you're like, why am I, why am I going out to, to places that are supposed to be uh, helping me? Like my doctor's office? Why is there not a cryotherapy chamber in the front? Well, they make me wait for a half hour. I could have totally taken my clothes off, frozen my ass off, put them back on, and then I wouldn't even have to see the doctor. But, but this is, these are questions we should be asking ourselves and questions that our healthcare providers should be asking themselves and things like our schools. Um, yes, Alan and Anna do cryotherapy. They're five and six years old and they know it makes them ripped. <laughs> I also thanks Jackie for being our model and Jackie's our podcast producer for Bulletproof Radio. See those wires coming off of her and see that look of glee as I'm making her scream? Uh, what we do here is electrical stimulation. And uh, what, what I did is I basically was like, this is what it feels like when you turn it on, which is why you get that look. And then I helped her do a squat here. And what's going on is we're causing her quads uh, and her, uh, her glutes to contract, in this case, about 250 times a second while she does a motion. And you cannot do this motion 250 times a second, even if you're like a real stud. So how, how do you get such rapid progress? And what happens? Well, what happens is you get neurological development as well as muscle development and oxygenation. And I believe if you're going to do a movement and you do that movement with the right electrical current over it, you'll always get more results from doing it with the electrical current. Whether you're training speed or training strength, you can do that. There are some things that you want to do without electricity, like ARX uh, or some of the other technologies that are out there. But let's... Uh, Let's talk about ARX, the next one. In fact, here's uh, Andy Nilo from Alatura. Uh, Andy's uh, he's out here, and uh, I've helped Andy start his company. Um, he's the guy who has the incredible Hulk face mask, Alatura the mask. Uh, I use that stuff. It, it uh, uh, basically pulls a lot of toxins out of your face. You can see a, a change when you use it even one time. And, uh, and he's come out with some other really cool stuff. But he came up to Bulletproof Labs. He's also a cover model for Oakley. Um, which is why he looks like that. And I just want to say, um, I am 10 years older than Andy, but on the ARX machine here, on a quantitative basis, uh, I did bench press more than him. <laughs> Truth be told, before that, I ran electrical current over, over him and had him do push-ups on the Bulletproof Vibe, <laughs> so I cheated. <laughs> Uh, but still, it was funny. Uh, so, and, and he's a total stud. But what this machine does, and there are two ARX machines out here that you should try in the tech hall. It, it's basically the idea that if you're going to pick up heavy stuff the way we've always done it, uh, the way our caveman ancestors, um, the ones that we are making extinct, um, the way they would do it is you know, pick up heavy. Nothing wrong with doing that. But when you pick up something heavy, like, okay, at this point, how much can you lift? At this point, how much can you lift? And at this point, how much can you lift? They're different numbers. So the first company to try and solve this problem was actually Nautilus. And if you're as old as I am, you remember, they used to have these machines with round gears on them. And then Nautilus had an elliptical gear, so you'd have more, more weight on the muscle at the parts where you were stronger. The problem is that if you're doing a bench press and you're all the way back here, and you have almost no strength, well, how do you make maximum contractions here and also maximum contractions here? Well, it's really, really difficult to solve that problem. So what you do there is you use a computer. So you're looking at how much pressure you're putting, you're using your brain to do that, but you're also using a winch to move the force. So there is no gravity involved in the system. Your body feels there's no gravity. There's no risk of letting go of something and hurting yourself or causing damage. So the proprioceptors in your arms and in all of your joints don't fire to defend you the same way. And what you end up doing is this incredibly hard thing, and I'm serious, everyone should try this. And when you do this, you're like, oh my God, how did this happen? But what you did was you had 100% effort throughout the entire power curve, which you could never do before this. And that causes rapid muscle adaptation, like much faster than you'd get from doing heavy weights. Did I just say more benefit in less time? Yes. 
Are there places on Earth where gravity doesn't really play a role in the way things work normally? No. If you're picking up logs in the forest, yes, you can get strong that way. But what we're doing is we're intentionally using technology to take gravity out of the equation. So the force you're fighting against is not gravity, and it's linear, and it's always maximum. When you do that, your body gets a signal that's stronger than Mother Nature can provide, the same way that cryo provides a cold stronger than Mother Nature can provide. It's that ability to manipulate your environment that allows us to get more changes in less time. I don't have a, a slide for it, but I have also a, a biodensity machine, which you can see at the, the front um, of the exhibit hall. Um, biodensity also uses a computer to show you your force, but you're pushing at something that doesn't move. So what you're doing with biodensity is you're creating bone flexion. You're actually bending your bones, and you can see it happen, which is kind of creepy, because you sort of feel like your bones shouldn't bend. Now, why would you ever train your bones? Well, bone density is kind of important for all sorts of things. But the way we normally train our bones is we jump, we move, we have impact. And impact is good, but impact is fleeting. So if you have lots of impact, your knees probably aren't going to like that, like long-distance runners. So what's that's a bit of a conundrum? It turns out by flexing the bone, you're causing a piezoelectric effect in the bone. Piezoelectricity basically means that like, when you move something, it generates electricity, and your bones generate a microcurrent. This has all been proven. Uh, I think Robert Beck wrote about that a long time ago, like in the 80s or 90s. So if you're pushing really hard on something enough to bend the bone at the right angle, then the bone will naturally get stronger. Now, the reason that I became interested in, in the biodensity is that if you're looking to make stronger bones... If you do normal exercise, 1% improvement in HbA1c. This is your blood marker for how well you process blood sugar. So basically, we measure it in diabetics and in non-diabetics to see how well we process carbs. If you take metformin, the most common diabetes drug, you get another 1% improvement in this marker. Or 10 minutes once a week, you flex your bones a bit on the biodensity, and you get an 8.2% improvement. 10 minutes, once a week, no drugs required. All you need is access to one of these machines. Should this be at your doctor's office? Yeah, it should be at your doctor's office or at your gym or somewhere where you can do this. So why do I talk about this stuff with all of you? Because you should know that you can beat drugs and exercise together by four times in 10 minutes once a week. And the fact that everyone doesn't know this kind of pisses me off. That's another picture of, of the ARX. I actually have an old uh, kind of ghetto-looking prototype, the last one that they made. The ones that here look like space-age aliens or something. Um, I also have a uh, hyperbaric oxygen chamber, and we've talked about hyperbaric oxygen already, about some of the benefits, so I'm not going to dwell on that as much. But I do that especially after I fly, or when I'm doing really intense brain training. I spend extra time doing that because you can do more. You can recover faster. You can grow your brain more. And having the ability to also do something you're unlikely to find in nature, a really unstable surface, to train yourself to have better vestibular function than you're likely to have from even playing in, in the forest the way uh, my friends at MoveNat would recommend and the way I also recommend. So to be able to stand on a, on a slack line and find your sense of balance to make your eyes and your brain work really hard and then to be able to even do something like juggle which I haven't learned how to do yet I can juggle a little bit but on this thing I just fall off still working on that one and infrared sauna you saw what it did for my sleep um, I have a sunlight and infrared sauna which is a really amazing thing to do for detox People have had toxic mold or Lyme, or just if you're tired after a long flight or just like something's wrong, you sit in there. It has a built-in uh, little screen. You can watch Netflix while you're in the sauna. You can do email. Your laptop won't overheat in 45 minutes, most likely. <laughs> it gets a little hot, and it's probably not good for it, but your phone will definitely work. But the point is, you're not losing this time. You can also, this is big enough for five people, but... You know, uh, Lana and I can go in the sauna together, and if we were going to sit on the couch and talk, we could sit in the sauna and talk. So you're not losing anything by doing something that also increases the calories you burn, and makes you sweat, makes you detox, and you can see a difference in your abs the next day. 
Uh, there's also uh, the, the human cloning tank. Uh, this is actually a flotation tank. This is a sensory deprivation tank. And I had to put some stickers on there, and these were the ones that came to mind. <laughs> My neighbors really think I'm weird. Um, the other thing that makes them think I'm weird is that outside, all of the lighting is red at night. Because I live in a forest, the only lights that I can see that are man-made for my house are three red lights on a radio tower, even though I'm a half hour from the airport. So I have owls, two different species, tons of nightlife, and lots and lots of bugs I can't even identify. And I didn't see the need to mess with their circadian biology. So I have a red light, so let me see just fine outside, but it looks like Count Dracula's castle. <laughs> when they come in and they see that, they're like, oh my god, he's going to eat me. But the effects of doing this, this type of flotation are, are pretty profound, especially with people with a lot of trauma. And if you do this on a regular basis for like every night for a month, you really feel like a, a nervous system reset that happens, uh, a resetting of the amygdala. Even your sensitivity to the world around you becomes smaller. And it's expensive to run one of these at home. It's annoying to have to maintain it just like a hot tub. Uh, so I'm not sure that this is the sort of thing that you really want to have at home. It's the sort of thing you want to go use somewhere. Uh, but when I'm experimenting with this, plus I live on Vancouver Island, so it's not like there's one of these next door. There are some about 45 minutes. Uh, float Labs in Victoria actually helped me set this up. So it's really neat to be able to put the kids in there to play with it. And uh, Alan, my son, uh, when he was five, had his first float. And it was really neat. He, he was a little afraid. And we didn't close the lid. You're just laying in about eight or nine inches of, of Epsom salt-soaked water. So you're floating on top of it. You can't sink. You have the lights on or off. Your choice. And I got him to, with the lid open just to lay down and relax. And I said, oh, OK, Alan, when he got out, he rinsed off. I said, you did a great job. That was your first time floating. Like, you rocked that. You, you did so well. He goes, Daddy, that wasn't my first time floating. And I'm like, oh, really? I was like, I'm pretty sure I know. And, and he goes, nope. I floated for 80 hours when I was inside mommy's tummy. Right. Now, you notice this kind of a round thing that's dark and full of warm water. Like, might trigger a few memories of the womb, right? Did we talk about how your nervous system gets, reset, gets set and gets programmed? Yeah, it does get programmed. It gets programmed when you're in the womb. It gets programmed when you're very, very young. So basically, he picked up on that right away, because when you're little, you still kind of are connected with that more than adults are. But when you throw an adult in there, it is a womb-like experience, and it causes your nervous system to act a little bit more flexibly. It's pretty neat technology. The, the final thing that's here is uh, neurofeedback. And it's kind of hard to tell what's going on here. I have a, a eight channel amplifier, or a, a, a distributor anyway, um, an electrode box on my chest, and electrodes glued all in my hair, which is why it looks so dorky. But uh, the ability to monitor my brain and to train my brain, both at Bulletproof Labs and in other places, has been really transformative for me. And you can get a, a simple thing like Muse for, for two, three hundred dollars. You can get uh, systems like the Neurooptimal that I carry on Bulletproof Labs, which is uh, costs about eighteen dollars a session, the lowest effective safe one that I could find, lowest cost effective safe one I could find after a lot of research. And then you can do, you can go to therapists who use it. And you can go to things like Forty Years of Zen, uh, which uh, is still one of our prizes. So any of these options can they can have profound effects, but these are things that I do at Bulletproof Labs at home. This is not a call to all of you to go out and build a crazy biohacking lab, unless that's your calling. What I'm saying is these are technologies that radically changed my life in human performance, and that I am actively upset that neurofeedback isn't at every school. <laughs> because if you want to teach kids to learn, maybe you could teach them to just regulate their own brains a little bit so that they could pay attention better. That kind of thing is worth so much more than memorizing the capital of every state. By the way, I don't know the capital of every state. I actually just don't care. Does that make me a bad person? I don't know. Thank you, guys. Come to the Bulletproof Conference to listen and learn and play. It's the immersive experience of the Bulletproof Conference that sets it apart. You actually get to touch the toys. You get to feel these things. You get to actually change your biology while you're there. And of course, you get to learn from the world's top experts. But more importantly, you get to play. 
I want as many people as possible to be able to learn and experience and play. This is actually fun. It's not a boring conference. It's an amazing chance to hang out with the right people and also to do all those things that you read about or that you heard me talk about or things that are in Bulletproof Labs. Now you get to play. I feel a responsibility to bring this kind of experience to as many people as possible and that's why we're growing the conference. I promise you, you're gonna have a good time. You'll learn about what high performance humans actually do in their daily lives. We're gonna focus a lot on brain performance and even some of the medical aspects of that. You'll learn about relationships and how you can change your relationships to change how you perform and how you feel every single day even to change the neurochemicals in your mind. And you'll learn about epigenetics, which is the study of how you can change the environment around you so that it changes your genes for you, putting you firmly in the driver's seat. We'll have the full retail store with discounts where you can get everything that you would expect to get at the Bulletproof Coffee Shop. You'll also learn more about light and flow states meditation, training your memory, gratitude, and the list goes on and on. There will even be specific speaker breakouts and hands-on workshops so you can actually get time with the people who speak at the conference. The Bulletproof Conference speakers are going to speak on topics that are really, really cutting edge. This is the stuff that I live and breathe, the things that have made the biggest difference in my own life. I wanna bring those to you and share them with you and let you talk to the guy next to you, talk to the woman on the other side of you, and sit down and say, you know what, I just made new friends and I made new friends doing some of the most impressive, most fun, most amazing things I've done in my entire life. That's what the Bulletproof Conference is all about. Please join me there, I look forward to hanging out with you.